Great to be with you again today. My name is Jason Dexter, and today we're going to continue our study of the book of Titus. We will be studying Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now, in the first chapter of the book of Titus, we have seen the qualifications for elders. Titus was to appoint elders in the churches in the Greek island of Crete. And Paul gives Titus very, very specific criteria for the types of leaders he is to appoint. And then after that, he tells Titus what a leader is to do. Notably, a leader is to warn the flock against false teachers and to deal with false teaching and false teachers when they arise. Moving into chapter 2, Paul shows what does a healthy church look like? What is the role of every person, every brother, every sister, every believer in the church? What are they to do? So we will go through this and uh, this passage shares a little bit about what leaders are to do, what old men are to do, what young men are to do, what older ladies are to do, and what younger ladies are to do. So it has you well covered. Let us read Titus 2, 1 through 5. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. And we'll come into verse 6 in the next study, which deals with young men. So as for you, Titus, he is to teach what accords with sound doctrine. So Paul, as he writes these letters to Titus and to Timothy, reminds them again and again, they are responsible to teach the truth. Not necessarily to teach what people like to hear, not to be ear ticklers, just to teach what is popular or what is deemed to be uh, culturally acceptable or politically correct. They are to teach sound doctrine. Now in the dictionary, doctrine is defined as a belief or set of practices held and taught by a church, political party, or other group. So in essence, Paul is telling Titus he should teach and that his teachings should be accurate. So it's very simple, but it's very important. A leader is to teach. That means that a leader is to come to God's word, which is God's authority, and then bring it to the flock and present what God's word says. That means that even the very idea of teaching shows that there is an authority, that we have an authority. That is God who has given us his authoritative word, scripture, which leads and guides us. And the leader's job is not to just share his own opinions or his own ideas, but he's to teach what accords with sound doctrine. So he is to understand God's word. He is to study it, to be a diligent student of the word. That will give him a solid foundation in his own walk with the Lord and his own theology. And then he's to teach that to the church. Now, Paul devoted much of his energy in his letters to exposing and refuting false teaching or unsound doctrine. And he didn't want Titus to be led astray into any heresies. If Titus gave bad teaching, those in the churches he ministered to would be negatively influenced by it. Paul gives many warnings like this and many encouragements to Titus and also to Timothy. Here's one he gave to Timothy. He says, follow the pattern of the sound words, similar idea to sound doctrine that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard it. You have the truth of God's word. You are to guard it. You are to stand firm on it. You are not to compromise in it. That is the charge given to leaders in the church. And also 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, Paul says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God. That is by faith. So as a shepherd, Titus was responsible to teach the sheep needed to be fed a shepherd doesn't just tell the sheep okay go and feed yourself go onto the internet and find some teaching somewhere he is supposed to guide them to the pasture 
teaching is necessary and it is useful. But the teacher needs to be very careful that what he's teaching is sound. And it's a lot better to sometimes say, I don't know, than to give wrong advice that is not from God's word. In James 3.1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That means that a teacher needs to be very, very careful what he says about God's word and make sure that it lines up with the truth. So how does this apply to you? Well, first of all, when you share with others, make sure that what you're sharing is sound doctrine. Whether you're promoting a book or whether you're sharing a website or recommending a pastor that people listen to, check what those sources are saying and compare them to God's word as the Bereans did in Acts 17.11. Acts 17, 11. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They were checking what Paul said with scripture to make sure that what Paul said was true. And at that time, checking scripture wasn't even as easy. They may have had to go to the synagogue to open up the scrolls to check them out. So we are to do no less. We need to compare what we hear, whether from the pulpit or online or from some other source, including from this video, this channel, and compare it to God's word and make sure it is accurate. So how can a person ensure he's teaching sound doctrine? Well, a teacher has the responsibility to make sure that his teaching is accurate and will not lead anyone astray. That's very serious. If, if a doctor just randomly prescribes medicine to people, then it's going to end up very badly. He needs to make sure that it is the right medicine. An architect cannot just randomly make up a blueprint. People's lives are at stake. He needs to be very, very precise in his math and in his measurements to make sure that it is a sound and it's a safe structure. In a similar way, teachers of the Bible are giving counsel to others in the form of teaching, which influences lives. It can affect whom a person marries, what career he chooses, how he educates his children, and a million other aspects of life. So we need to make sure that when we are sharing about God's word with others, we are doing so in a way that protects sound doctrine. So we can ask ourselves some questions. Is this just my opinion? Or is it biblical truth? And always ask yourself, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible really back up what I'm saying here? Our opinions are not always sound, and we need to always reevaluate those with Scripture. We can also ask, am I adding to or taking away from Scripture? Let the plain words of Scripture be our guide. Another way that we can check our teaching is by comparing it to some major Christian creeds in the past where believers have gotten together and have basically said these are the important doctrines from God's word which we need to pay attention to. You could also ask yourself, is this teaching that I'm sharing something new? Now it's possible that you might have a new angle on some passage that no one has ever preached or written about but it's rather unlikely because there are many very good Bible scholars who came before you. Sometimes I think there's too much interest these days in sharing something new. And I understand it as a preacher or as a Bible teacher, you feel the need to give some kind of new insight to others. In some way that even validates the teacher saying, look, I have something new to share with you about this passage. But actually finding something new that others haven't is rather unlikely. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Many new teachings are just spurious. So God's word, we don't always have to make something new out of it. We just actually remind ourselves of the basics again and again. Think about how often you teach you know, new things to, to your children. Obviously, a child is growing up. They are learning new things. But probably most of the content that parents teach their children is repetition, reminding them again and again and again of very basic and important things. Turn off the light when you leave the room. Uh, make sure to brush your teeth before you go to bed. Eat healthy. Get good exercise. And the same kinds of things will come up again and again and again. Things that parents a thousand years ago also taught their children. So we shouldn't always be fixated with something new or exciting. We should be most focused on just teaching the clear and plain truth of God's word. 
And if you look in the Bible, you'll find that there's many, many uses of the word remember or remind. And that much of the teaching in scripture is just repeated over and over again because we have short memories and we forget easily. Another question we can ask ourselves as we are trying to teach or share with others is, am I submitting myself and my teaching to the oversight of a godly group of biblically appointed elders, leaders in the church. God appointed the office of elder for a reason, and a plurality of elders can provide safety that can keep one another and the church accountable. Where one person might go astray into some line of thinking that is not biblical, perhaps due to emotion or maybe being deceived or some other reason, it's less likely that a whole group of godly and mature elders will together all fail for that false teaching. So from verse one, the application is twofold. First of all, when you share God's word, make sure that you're teaching sound doctrine. And if you're not sure, do further study and ask some other godly and mature believers to help you. And second of all, make sure that the sources you put in, that is the, the preaching you listen to, the books that you read, come from a source that is also teaching sound doctrine. The best way to do that is to study God's word for yourself and compare what you hear with it. All right, let's go into what Paul told Titus to teach to the old to the people in the church. So Titus wasn't only to teach doctrine. Actually, from verse 2 forward in this chapter, it shows that Titus was to teach practice. He was to teach behavior or he was to teach application. He was to teach people how they were to live. So actually verses two and four are directed to Titus. These are the things he is to teach the people in his church. By implication, we can take from that, okay, that if you are an older man, you should be doing these things. If you're an older woman, you should also be doing these things. Uh, but these were things that Titus was to teach, and these are things that pastors, elders, leaders, Sunday school teachers, Bible study teachers today should be teaching the same things. And we can get a simple lesson from this. It talks about older men, older women, younger men, younger women. Everyone has a role in the church. Now, the book of Titus is a pastoral letter in which Paul instructs Titus in many aspects of church life. In chapter 1, he describes the role of elder and the person who's qualified for that job. And then in chapter 2, he goes into this is what everybody in the church is supposed to be doing. A healthy church is not just about having healthy leadership. Every person has a unique role to play. Each member of the church is vital. You can read 1 Corinthians 12 where Paul compares the church to a body. Uh, also, we... Being a, a, I like to play basketball, and on a basketball team, you have different people fulfilling different roles, but working together for the same goal. If me, being a rather tall player, tried to be the point guard and control the ball all of the time, it would not end up well for the team. Rather, the coach would tell me, go inside, play inside, that's where you should uh, play and that's where you should touch the ball. So if each person wants the limelight or the spotlight, the glory of shooting all the time, then the team will be dysfunctional and it will not work well. In a similar way, our body, if one part of our body is not working, if my throat is sore, then I am sick. And if I have circulation problems, it affects the whole body. If I have spine pain, it limits my mobility. The feet are not more important than the hands, which are not more important than the eyes, which are not more important than the mouth. Every part in our body is important and every part has a role to play. Similarly, in the church, every person in the church is important to the overall health and function of a healthy church body. Recently, I was talking with a good friend of mine, a brother in the church here, and he was sharing a testimony where before he felt like he didn't really have a, a role um, in the church. He didn't see himself as being useful. But later he realized that his acts of service in just helping people who were in need actually reached people for the Lord. And he was so encouraged to hear their testimonies saying that his service to them made a big impact on their walk with the Lord. And it reminded me again, every person has a role and we need to play our role in the church the best we can for God's glory. So know that you also have an important role. Don't think that it's just the elder or the pastor, the one up front on the stage is important. 
Don't be passive, expecting the leaders to do all the work. Your job is not just to spectate. You do have a job, and it's important. And I would consider, I would ask you to consider, and and think about what is that job? What is your role in the church? Do you know it, and are you doing it? Well, Paul then starts off with uh, older men. Well, first of all, what is older? Uh, remember again, Paul is writing to Titus and not directly to the church congregation. So it would be Titus's job to bring these words of encouragement to various people in the church. Now, the age of older men is not clearly defined. Is it 75? Is it 40? Are you an older man? The answer, to some extent, is relative. I am older than some in the church, but I'm also younger than others. It's not about a specific age. A man should be growing in all of these areas as he matures. And there's no age where you will magically receive these character qualities mentioned. These are things which should typify an older person as he grows and as he matures. And really, wherever you are on this spiritual walk, you are older in Christ than some others. You might have believed for a year. Well, you can help someone along who has just placed their faith in Christ. You might have believed for 10 years. You can help someone along who has followed the Lord for five years. And as you grow and walk forward on this journey, you will find those who are younger than you and you can share with them wisdom or experience you have gained, which can help them. I have a 13-year-old son, and he leads a short Bible study with some toddlers or young children of families who come to an adult Bible study at our home. Uh, he, But he, in turn, is the youngest member of a soccer team. There are several older teenagers who act as role models for him. And then they all have a coach who, in turn, also looks to others for wisdom and guidance. So what we do see here is that a healthy church is relational. Everybody is to be learning from someone and then passing on what they learn to others. A healthy stream keeps moving, and many benefit from the water as it cycles through. Disease and bacteria build up when a pool of water has no outlet. So think again, application. Who are you older than, even if not in age, than in faith in your local church? How can you come alongside and mentor those who are younger? And at the same time, remember that you also need a mentor to encourage you in your own walk with the Lord. So older men should be encouraged in their role. An older man might get discouraged. His physical strength likely isn't what it was in the past. He may be beyond the prime of his life, so to speak. In the workplace, maybe younger or stronger men have taken over for him. He's seen his children grow older and become more independent. As a result, he might be tempted to think that he is somehow not useful and his best days are past. I was remembering the movie Up with uh, Mr. Fredrickson, where at the beginning of the movie, he thinks he's basically his life is done. Uh, he's past his meaningful uh, existence and he's just ready to sit in his decliner, reminiscing the past and waiting to die. But then later he realized, oh, he can mentor someone younger. Uh, Titus should encourage the older men to do this. They have a vital role to play in a healthy church. They are neither forgotten nor are they replaced. It's never time to retire from working for the Lord. There's much work to do, and Titus should encourage them to do it. The example and the experience of Older men is so valuable. Their physical strength is less than before, but their experiences are more. These experiences combined with many years of service and Bible study give them wisdom that younger men may lack. Even this morning in my family devotions, we were looking at uh, Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. And they wanted to stone her. And then Jesus said, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. And it was the older ones who walked away first rather than the younger ones. The younger ones were likely more hot-headed and more prideful and thinking that they were actually righteous enough to do it. Also, in the case of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, when Solomon dies, Rehoboam takes the kingdom and the people come to Solomon and they say, the yoke your father gave us is very heavy. It's too much work for us. It's too hard. Lighten our load that we will follow you. 
Rehoboam says, give me a few days and I'll, I'll get some counsel and get back to you. And so he talks to the older men who give very wise advice. They say, give a calm, give a gracious, give a kind answer to them, show them you care for them, and, and then they will follow you the rest of your life. And then the younger men, though, gave a different kind of advice. They said, no, show how tough you are, show how strong you are, show them that you are the man. And they use some very, very strong language in their counsel to him. And so he followed their advice and he answered those people very, very harshly. And they said, well, if it's like that, we're done. We're not following you. And so they split and did not follow Rehoboam or any of the southern kingdom kings after that point in time. So older men here give some specific character qualities they are to follow. They're to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. The character steadfastness is especially important in this context. It shows that they have fought the good fight and they're finishing the race. Steadfast in years of service to the Lord has proven their faith. The temptations of the world did not sign lie them or cause them to go astray, but they hopefully learn from those and they have a good testimony and experience to share. Their testimony can help others follow in their footsteps and live a life of faithful service to the Lord without wavering. In 1 John 2.13, John says, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Those who are older have a deeper knowledge of the Lord. And with that, they can serve as mentors for those who are not as far along in their spiritual journey. So, do you have a mentor? Do you have someone who is older than you in the faith who can guide you, who can answer questions and help you with questions you might have about marriage, about raising children, about so many aspects of life? Recently, my oldest son turned 13 and we realized, well, we've never raised a teenager before. He's our oldest of four. And so we asked some friends uh, from our church who were older than us and they already had gone through raising teenagers and their kids were already in university or beyond. And we said, look, we need some advice. How is it different? What lessons can you share? Perhaps lessons of success or maybe even lessons of failure, things that you would do differently. What can you share with us now that can help prepare and equip us as we get ready to raise a teenager for the first time? So we need those mentors. We should humble ourselves and come to them and ask for advice. And we can get very good advice that can help our life. And that's true not just for the old men, but also for the older women. Titus goes on in verse 3. He says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So we come to the older women. Again, we won't put an exact age number on it. It is somewhat relative. As Christian sisters grow in maturity, they have hopefully more wisdom and certainly more experience that they can share with those who are younger. Now, older women, like older men, may be tempted to think that they cannot do much and that their useful years are behind them. Paul makes it very, very clear this isn't the case. He says they have a very, very vital role to play in the church, to mentor, to train, to raise up those who are younger. God doesn't forget or overlook anybody. The church is healthy when all the members come together and perform their part in harmony for His glory. There are many examples in the Bible of older women who come alongside and encourage or mentor others. Uh, one of the first that comes to mind is Naomi, who mentored and encouraged Ruth and ended up helping Ruth in the process of marriage with Boaz. Now, the first thing older women should focus on is their own character. And Paul lists out several character qualities that they need to focus on. They are to be reverent in behavior. Reverence means feeling or showing a deep and solemn respect. So they should be 
serious and dignified. They're not to be slanderers. So they should be careful about their speech. Older women tend to have more free time than others. And their older women, women in general, normally like to talk more than most guys. And so that can be a very, very good thing. But it also can be a double-edged sword that older women should be careful about. Titus was to encourage them to walk, watch over their words so they wouldn't talk negatively about others or create division or conflict within the church. Certainly, uh, gossiping or anything of that nature fits under this category of slandering. So, on the other hand, the women could use their words and use their speech to encourage and train up and help those who need to grow in their faith. Older women were also not to be slaves of wine. That means that they should be productive and to use their time well. Again, not to think that the best of their days is behind them and just waste away their time, perhaps in some type of pity or, or sorrow about something that happened previously in their life. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says that wine is a mocker and would rob the women of their positive testimony and impact on those around them. Uh, I'm not sure why this specific instruction is given to older women. It could be for some reason in that society, older women were more prone to that uh, than some others. In any, way, in, in any case, Titus is to remind them, look, don't waste your time in those unproductive pursuits. Instead, spend your time productively because you still have so much to offer to the church. The older women, we see their, their key thing there to do in verse 4 is to train the young women. So they are to be mentors. They are to teach what is good. And again here, we see the relational aspect of the church. It's not just the elders who are doing the teaching. It's not just the pastor on the stage. Many churches function with that type of top-down structure where the paid clergy do all the work. All the counseling, the evangelism, the teaching, and the lay people are, are just keeping their place to sit and listen to the professionals. This mentality was common for much of church history. Church members were not even allowed to read the Bible in their own language for much of the Middle Ages. All the power was reserved for the clerics. And those ignorant people sitting in the pews were not to open their mouths uh, and put put it you know put their noses into what didn't belong to them. So said the pastors or the the priests at that time. Shadows of this priest and layperson division remains in many churches today. But notice how Paul empowers individuals in the church, and specifically a segment of society that was not regarded as having much of anything to offer. And think about the fact that Paul was a Jew. A Jewish rabbi once said it's better to burn the law than to even teach it to a woman. Women were not allowed to come into the, the place that the men were to learn. So Paul actually says in another passage to let the women learn. Women were to learn the truth from scripture. And here we see they are also to be those who are passing it on to others. In Jewish society at that time, women were considered to be very, very low. And for much of church history, the priest would certainly not want the older women to, to do this kind of teaching and sharing with others. But here we see this is something which Titus is to encourage the older women to do. Now, the platform for the teaching is not the same. Paul is not talking about having them up on stage necessarily, but it's this relational aspect. The platform could be different, but the roles were both important. The older women were to mentor the younger. Their experiences in marriage, in raising children, following the Lord, and so many other areas were invaluable and vital to pass on. Now, we should be reminded that a mentor is not required to be perfect or to have done everything right themselves. Someone might say, I can't do that because I made so many failures in my own life and in my own marriage. But you know, even their failures could be used as teaching opportunities to say, look, in my marriage, this is what I did. It didn't end well. 
This is what I see you doing. And I want to warn you, don't go that route, right? They can use even their mistakes to teach others so that they don't make the same ones. Now, as discussed before, there's no magic age where a person becomes old and able to mentor. It's a relative thing. A woman who's married can offer advice to one who's getting ready for marriage. An older single woman who chose another ministry instead of marriage can also offer counsel and encouragement, even comfort to a younger sister who's still single. One who has young children can help those who, who are expecting. Wherever you are on this journey, it's likely that someone is not as far along as you are. So two questions. Are you offering that mentorship and advice and encouragement to those younger than you? You should be doing this actively in your church. And second, have you sought that mentorship and wisdom from those older than you? We should be doing that as well. Okay, and then it comes to the young women. And again, this is in the context of Titus sharing with older women what they in turn are to share with young women about what young women are to do. And so there's several aspects, love, their husbands, and children. Most instructions in scripture talking about the wife say to submit. We do see that in verse 5, but this one says to love. And I think that's really important. I think I actually, someone actually told me once and said, the Bible never says that a wife is to love their husband. Well, actually it does say that here in Titus 2, 4. So both the husband is to love the wife and the wife is to love the husband. The submission that he talks about in verse 5 is to come from a loving heart. All of the qualities of love shown in 1 Corinthians 13 are to be mutually shown to one another by husband and wife. So scripture often emphasizes the husband's duty to love. It's also a wife's duty uh, to love her husband. And she should love her children. That's very, very necessary for a wife and a mother. Love sacrifices for others. A godly wife should sacrifice for her family. And there are so, so many practical ways in the home whereby the mother and the wife can show love to her family. Uh, also, the younger women were to be self-controlled. A maturing woman needs to be self-controlled. The context of this instruction is family life. A godly wife should not allow her emotions to take over and then to lose control of herself by lashing out at her husband or her children. There can be so many frustrating situations in the home. Children make messes, spill things, break things, sometimes vomit on the carpet in the middle of the night. And that can be so stressful for the ladies who are more close to the children or spending more time with the children sometimes than the husbands are. Young women need to anchor themselves in the Lord, getting strength from him to pull through with a good attitude. And by the way, husbands need to be observant and sensitive to see when their wife is being stressed and overloaded. And because the husband is supposed to love the wife, he may need to step in and say, let me help out with this situation. There's so many opportunities to do that also for the husbands. But self-control is very important. And actually, all four groups, I think, uh, it was said to have self-control, or at least some reference was made toward it. The older men were to be self-controlled. The older women um, were to be reverent in their behavior, which implies self-control. The younger women were to have self-control, and then the younger men also in verse 6 were supposed to have self-control. So it seems like this is a very important quality that all believers need. And that self-control doesn't just come from you know your own willpower to say, I'm going to do better next time. I'm going to restrain my temper. It comes from getting close to the Lord. And as you get close to the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit works in your heart so you have that true uh, fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, the next thing that the young women were to do is to be pure. Uh, women are to be pure in action and in thought life. Uh, purity is often 
again, emphasized to men in the Bible, since men tend to struggle with purity more, or at least in a more obvious way. But this passage makes it clear that godly women are to be chaste. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This applies to men and women. Both sides need to make sure that they're actively putting on Jesus and giving no opportunity for the flesh. That means putting in some practical safeguards. So this means that the younger women should put in some practical safeguards to help keep themselves pure. You can consider what kind of practical safeguards are helpful uh, for that. And remembering that the battle is oftentimes fought in the mind. Uh, the books you read, the web pages you visit, the movies you watch all go into your mind and are important in this. The next thing that the younger women were encouraged to do is to be workers at home, working at home. Uh, this phrase certainly doesn't preclude any work outside the home. It doesn't say that you can do no work outside the home, but rather that women should be working at home. That seems to be the primary focus of her attention or of her uh, special role in her special sphere inside the body of Christ. Uh, if you want to know more about working at home and what that can look like, you can read Proverbs chapter 31. The, complement, the complementarian view of gender roles is seen throughout scripture, and that is that a husband and a wife have different but complementary roles. Galatians 3.28 shows that men and women are equal in God's sight. They have equal value. They're both created in the image of God. They have one spirit, one Lord, one faith. All of these things are true. In Though they are equal in God's sight, equal in importance and in value, yet the role for men and women is seen to be different in Scripture. And actually, when both sides faithfully fulfill their God-given roles, the family will be at its most harmonious. When the husband is loving his wife and leading her, not as a, a boss or an overlord, but leading her as a servant, that makes it easier for her to respect him and to follow his lead and to help him and to be a companion for him. Now note that it says that a wife is to work at home, not merely sit or relax at home. Uh, and the ladies that I know who are at home are definitely working at home. It is so, so much work and a lot of them are doing more work than even their husbands are. Uh, managing the home well is difficult and it takes a lot of work. It's also very rewarding. I know that for myself, sometimes I am off of work and I'm ready to take a break and my wife is still very busy in the home with many, many things. Uh, in some cultures, there's this idea that a housewife is something uh, attained to when the family is wealthy enough and that a rich housewife is something to aspire to, to think I don't need to lift my hand to do any work, and then they may spend their time shopping for more stuff, more shoes, or whatever. That is perhaps a worldly idea of what a so-called housewife is, but according to scripture, the wife is to be a worker at home. Everyone in the family of God is called to work. Work is a good thing. Some people said, oh, work only came after the fall. Actually not. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you will see that Adam and Eve, even before they sinned, were commanded by God to cultivate the Garden of Eden. God always intended for people to work. And when we work, doing the thing that God has designed and called us to, it makes our life fulfilled and meaningful. So there's many, many areas uh, that this can be applied. Uh, next, we see verse 5 that <clears throat> the woman is to be kind and submissive to her own husband. So again, God has designed certain authority structures in every area of life. He's put authorities in place in the political sphere, that is governments, the social sphere, that is bosses and, uh, yeah, bosses of companies, the spiritual sphere, elders over the church, and the 
family sphere, parents over children, and the wife to submit to the husband. What does this tell us? It tells us that God is an orderly God. He doesn't want confusion and chaos. He doesn't want there to be multiple people or groups all vying for leadership and bickering about who is in charge. A home with multiple heads cannot function well, and neither can a home with no head. God's design of one clear head is best. So wives who truly seek to honor God will submit to their husbands graciously and with a sweet spirit, as you can see in 1 Peter chapter 3. However, that submission does not mean and should never mean that the wife should not share her opinions with her husband or that the husband need not consider the wife. Again, there's a whole picture. We're only looking at the women today, but you can study Ephesians 5 for what the husband is supposed to do. The husband is to love and to lead and to cherish and to sanctify his wife, and the wife in turn is to respect her husband. So having that clear authority structure, God is basically solving so many problems before they happen. Now speaking as a husband, I don't think, oh, I am the head, then, wow, this is, this is great. I have so much power. Instead, I realized, wow, there, first, it's a big responsibility before the Lord. Who's going to hold me accountable? And second, I need help and I need wise counsel from others and from my wife. And I also think that, that husbands should not often use that trump card, so to speak, like saying, I'm the boss, you need to listen to me. This is, this is not the, the first route that husbands should go. A husband and a wife should seek to build consensus and agreement as they both together follow the Lord because we are two are one. Right? We are to be one mind, we are to be one purpose, we are to be one spirit following the Lord. And if the husband and wife are going in different directions, that will not be good for the marriage. And I found in my marriage, in the vast, vast majority of cases, my wife and I can agree on decisions that we make. Why? Because we are both seeking after the Lord. So the husband is called to be a servant leader. For the husbands, always talk with your wives about serious issues and try to come to an agreement before making decisions. Come to agreement before a course of action. And in some areas, your wife may have more expertise or experience than you. You can also say, I trust your judgment. You decide. And it's also okay for the husband to say, let's try it your way. Being the head means that the final authority made to make a decision is given by God to the husband so that the house will run in an orderly manner. And sometimes, especially on some very important or moral issues, then the husband has to be willing to exercise that God-given authority for the good of his family, but doing so in a humble and a loving and a gracious way and also to love his wife sacrificially. Now, there's another point I want to make about this that's really important. It says submissive to their own husbands, to their own husbands. And that means some guys get the idea, okay, all the sisters in the church and all ladies need to submit to me. That's not what the scripture is saying. It says that the wife should submit to her own husband, not to all men everywhere. So that's very important to take note of. Now, if you move forward, Paul gives a reason why these things should be the case. He says that the word of God may not be reviled. The purpose of all of these instructions is so that the body of Christ will follow the word of the Lord and therefore be a good testimony and will glorify him in all that they do. So whether you're an older man, an older woman, or a younger woman, or a leader of the church, I hope that today's passage gave you some food to chew on about your role, that your role is very, very important. And if you do what God has called you and designed you to do, then your family, your home, and your church can be a harmonious place where we encourage, build up, support, and uplift one another. For the younger men, uh, tune in next time. We're going to be studying Titus chapter 2, verses 6 to forward, and just a couple verses about younger men, and then the rest of the chapter about other aspects of church life. So I hope that this lesson was, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope this lesson was beneficial for you, and I will encourage you to join us next time as we continue studying the book of Titus one passage at a time. God bless. Hope to see you then.